All right, greetings, friends. It's Chapo, Monday, June 5th. And today we are going to be discussing the life and career of the longest serving and probably most influential judge on the Supreme Court. That's right. We're talking Clarence Thomas with the man who literally wrote the book on him. Joining us today is the author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas and The Reactionary Mind, Professor Cordy Robin. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Cordy. We wanted to talk to you about Clarence Thomas because, like, obviously, in light of the Dobbs decision and then his long term relationship with historical artifact aficionado Harlan Crow, it certainly put the, the Supreme Court in the forefront of everyone's minds. And I guess I'd like to begin with, like, something we've discussed on the show that was uh, very indebted to your work and uh, your book on Clarence Thomas that I think is most likely to up- upend the conventional wisdom on Clarence Thomas, like who he is and his ideology. And that is like the, the fact that, that basically like Clarence Thomas's ideology begins with the fact that he is or was, I don't know, I mean, I'm interested in your take on this, but with black nationalism and radical politics, like that defined his early political awakening and his early career. But like, let's begin there. Clarence Thomas's politics as like uh, in terms of black nationalism and black separatism and how that sort of upends the liberal conventional wisdom about who Clarence Thomas is and what his uh, career represents. Sure. So um, Thomas, he was born in Georgia in 1948 um, into great poverty. And when he's 19, he comes to the North. Um, A lot of things had happened to him along the way. But one could say when he comes to the North and uh, enrolls at Holy Cross, he's part of a very small cohort of black male students um, fairly illustrious cohort, I, people who go on to be illustrious. And he is radicalized by the experience of coming north. Um, he had been obviously used to Jim Crow and this intense racism of the South. But in the north, he encounters something new, which is uh, what we would you know call liberal racists, uh, liberal right, white racists. And these are people who, who in his uh, telling are, you know, benevolent, friendly, overtly sympathetic to the progress of African Americans, uh, but are always there to remind African Americans that that they are benevolent, that they have that they have extended a helping hand, and it is that experience um, that pushes him further to the left. He's already, fair, you know, very much sympathetic and part of the Black Freedom struggle. Um, and he becomes immersed in in the teachings and the speeches and the writings of Malcolm X. Uh, he memorizes the speeches of Malcolm X. He he listens to them on records, um, which is how back in the day people used to take that kind of stuff in. Um, and uh, he really takes a turn. He he founds the Black Student Union at at uh, Holy Cross. Um, he drafts, helps draft their manifesto, which has a very strong statement against interracial relationships, um, favoring kind of much more race conscious uh, black studies programs. He helps lead walkouts. He, he's the full the full deal. And, you know, we could talk about what happens afterwards. But the argument of my book is that a lot of the basic tenets that he uh, soaks in during that period of time even as he will later move to the right, he doesn't lose those tenets. And just very briefly what they are um, is first a belief that white racism is permanent, that it is not going away, that it continues to structure the fate of black Americans. Second, that black Americans have a fate and a destiny that's different, fundamentally different and apart from the wet rest of America. Um, that black people should look to black institutions uh, for their uh, development and um, protection apart from white institutions. And that uh, black men in particular are the the group of people upon whom the salvation of black people more generally depends. All of those beliefs he develops while he's in college and holds onto, onto the Supreme Court. 
I mean, you mentioned uh, Malcolm X, but um, he also is quoted as saying he very much ad- admired the uh, black Muslims that he encountered for their attitude of essentially going, going it on your own, like don't expecting help or even asking for it. Now, and then when asked, you know, like what what's caused you to stop becoming a liberal, he says, I was never a lit- liberal. I've always been a radical. Now, like th- this follows a certain... Uh, a certain well-trod path of like, is this an old story of a radical becoming disillusioned and deciding they'd rather win than bang their head against the wall of liberalism for the rest of their life and just joining the winning team? Or is there something more here in Thomas's seemingly political and ideological conversion to like the, a Reagan administration appointee and right wing Supreme court justice? Yeah. I mean, you're right to say that that is an old, um, uh, trodden category, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the, the group that I think that it parallels a lot are the kind of the neoconservatives, particularly Jewish neoconservatives, who began on some you know part of the left and oftentimes took a turn to the right, in part from a sense of Jewish particularism and a sort of a threat to um, kind of Jewish collective identity. And I think there's a parallel there that's interesting to be drawn with Clarence Thomas. Um, the part that I, I would contest, though, is, is that I don't think it was simply about joining the winning team. I, I think there was a much deeper uh, disaffection that really developed there with the idea of politics more generally. And when I say politics, I mean everything from electoral politics to social movements to more radical kinds of protest. Thomas, you know, beginning in you know the early to mid seventies, really develops a pretty far going critique that that kind of politics is not a sphere that black people can ever win in. That that politics is essentially the sphere of white people, and that any path you try to pursue through those means is going to be a disaster for black people. And he holds on to this uh, point of view well into you know, well into the, again, into, into his time on the Supreme Court. And that it's ironically that it's the marketplace and capitalism, the economy that he thinks really offers, I wouldn't say, you know, great possibilities for progress or anything like that, but, but niches, let's say, or spaces to, to use a fancier term, um, that, you know, for where, where black people, particularly black people like his grandfather, these kind of strong black men, can uh, amass property, can amass wealth, and thereby uh, uh, extend their largesse and protection to the rest of the Black community. And that's a pretty deep belief um, that propels him and brings him toward the Republican Party. Um, So, you know, everybody has some level of opportunism, obviously, in them. uh, But but I think it's 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 a genuine conversion. How does it like in, in Thomas's mind, like how does he regard the uh, the civil rights movement and like the Voting Rights Act or Civil Rights Act were about which were about political enfranchisement of black people in this country? Like, was he saying that, like, oh, we, we should have just like skipped that step and give everyone a business or something? Like, I mean, how does how do economic rights come absent political ones in his conception of things? You know, I think he, the, the place to begin with an answer to that is is his sort of the biography and historically. He looks back on Jim Crow uh, in the South, and he sees his grandfather, who was, you know, one or two, uh, uh, two generations removed from slavery. And his grandfather runs a, uh, a, a fuel business, a very small fuel business, where he delivers first wood, then coal, and then oil to Black people in Savannah. And he's able to, you know, amass a certain amount of wealth. He becomes a, a property owner. He eventually becomes a landlord. And, you know, there are no political rights for African-Americans during this time period. And I, you know, if I were to fill in some of the gaps of Thomas's argument, he would say that the black community was able to amass, you know, small pockets of wealth um, and that uh, the without political rights uh, and that certainly the, you know, he thinks the Voting Rights Act has been mostly, uh, you know, quite detrimental to African-Americans. One of his earliest opinions on the court, um, Holder v. Hall, is a whole extended critique of the whole idea that Black people could find their collective interests satisfied through anything like the act of voting. 
So he's been pretty clear about that from the start, um, that, that that's not a path. Whereas, while again, I wouldn't say, I don't think he thinks that um, economic progress is sort of uh, guaranteed by any measure. Uh, he does think that you could sort of eke out these, you know, small places uh, where you could survive um, for black people. Um, you know, and interestingly, you know, and it really is like the black entrepreneur. It's it's not, you know, supporting the black la- uh, working class. It's not, you know, people, you know, black workers working for big companies owned by white people. It's these sort of small businesses uh, that he believes is kind of this, the, the the path for black people to take. It's amazing. There's there that that his his opinion on the indelible nature of racism in America and the untranscendable barrier between white and black is one that a lot of commenters on the putative left love to point out they 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 make that exact point but then they all end up saying and you should still vote for democrats it's like if if if, if that with that if that is your overriding critique of american political reality then the thomas uh response is more certainly more coherent than to say no you should be voting for democrats anyway maybe something will get better and in the meantime, people like me will make money and be able to, to advance uh, as like right. uh, interlocutors between the communities. Right. In, ta- in fact, Thomas, during the 80s, that, it, that exact issue comes up and he says, look, you know, all you people quoting Malcolm X, Malcolm X never thought you should support the Voting Rights Act. Malcolm X never thought that you should, you know, favor the Department of Labor investigating, uh, you know, uh, discrimination against the workplace. Malcolm X thought that was a completely... Uh, you know, a misbegotten adventure. Um, and so he, you know, claims very forthrightly that the logical implication of that kind of intense racial pessimism um, or Afro-pessimism, as it's you know sometimes called, the, the, the logical implication is, is that Black people have to completely vacate the political stage. That there's, you know, not only is there nothing to be gained, there's actually some real harm that could that could come from that kind of level of engagement. Uh, But yeah, I mean, your point is, is, is very much, you know, to the point. uh, And and Thomas, you know, would agree. I mean, like, uh, but, but at at the end of the day, though, he is still a political actor who is like, you know, he is engaging in American politics in the way that like, you know, is supreme. The few individuals get uh, the ability to, to do so and decide these matters. So, I mean, like in engaging with politics, he's like, he's like, look, I've seen it. I do the political stuff, but I'm here to tell you it's all bullshit. And so right. that's why it's okay if I remove certain rights from that we thought were sacrosanct or all agreed upon. That, you know, there's a couple of like, you, you reach a couple of impasses with Thomas where, you know, things don't add up. I mean, not more than a couple, I should say. But that's one of the key ones um, that I, you know, I don't think you can resolve within the framework of his own thought. I just think it's an impasse. The only thing I will say about that impasse is that it's very similar to the kinds of things you see in a lot of libertarian intellectuals who, you know, really, you know, have this sort of critique of the state and the state's involvement in in politics more generally, and yet they are supreme political actors, um, oftentimes the most authoritarian parts of the state. Um, And and it's, it's, you know, I've encountered this, you know, because I've written a lot about Hayek. It's something that's just ultimately not resolvable. And that they don't provide any kind of theoretical account of, um, and so I, all I would say about with Thomas is that it's it's a familiar problem for I think a certain kind of right wing intellectual. Well, uh, speaking of right wing intellectuals, uh, the person that credited most with Thomas's seeming ideological conversion is the uh, the thinker Thomas Sowell who is like one of these guys that I see routinely cited as among like the greatest right wing intellectuals of the 20th century. He should be taught in schools, whatever, who just like broadly, who is Thomas Sowell and what about his, his thinking influenced Clarence Thomas so heavily? Yeah. So Thomas Sowell is an economist, um, uh, actually was, uh, trained in, in the kind of the Marxist tradition. I'm a little, sketchy on on how long he was immersed in that, but he comes out of that tradition and he uh, gets then influenced by the University of Chicago uh, and that style of economic thought. And he makes a turn in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And um, in 1974, I think it is, he writes a book called Race and Economics. And uh, Thomas gets, Clarence Thomas gets a phone call 
Um, he's by that point, he's living in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri. And an old friend of him says, you know, I just read this review in the Wall Street Journal of this new book by this guy. And he sounds as crazy as you do. And you've got to read the book. And so Thomas gets the book, Race and Economics. And he's he, you know, he sort of narrates it as a conversion experience. Um, obviously, the conversion has sort of slowly been happening for some time anyway. And he, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about the book in a second, but just, to, you know, he, he finds out that uh, Soul is coming to St. Louis and he goes, you know, he makes the drive up to St. Louis, he, you know, and he's got a whole bunch of copies of the book and Soul is coming to debate, um, turns out to be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who is at that time a kind of up and coming lawyer. And what I think Thomas, you know, Thomas takes a lot of things from that book, but the th- What's overwhelming in that book is this whole idea about the impact of capitalism on the black experience. And it is a very interesting reading. I mean, it's it's totally fanciful and and absurd, but nevertheless, uh, at the time was kind of influential, which is that the slaveholder, you know, was, you know, the the white slaveholder is the the master of his domain, the, the master of that space. But the one force that the white slaveholder could never master, the force that mastered the slaveholder, was that of the market and capitalism. And you get this sense in reading that book that um, even white supremacy and the, and the white slaveholder cannot um, overcome the powers of capitalism. And that's really what Thomas takes. Um, it's almost kind of like a revenge fantasy, you might say. And, and it, it provides for Thomas a kind of blueprint um, or a roadmap for his, his, his sort of broader move to the right. It provides a, you know, a, a kind of deep ideological infrastructure for him. Well, I mean, it goes back to this idea about like the political sphere versus the economic sphere and his, 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 his like, you know, his great privileging of economic freedom as being a path to like actual freedom. And. You know, like it's 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 not a you know totally ridiculous idea, right? The right the idea that like oh you have all these political freedoms, but they don't really mean anything without economic power and the capital and like you know wealth and like a, a social network to build off of. Wouldn't that for some imply the logical necessity of uh, distributing economic rights the way we do political ones, and not the opposite? As opposed to yeah. like, you know, because it, it's not like Thomas is trying to like uh, help out people economically all that much either, or at least in the right wing right. ideology he represents, at least by my estimation. Right. Um, so uh, let me say a couple of things about that. I mean, the first thing to, to say about that, that view um, is that, you know, Thomas and Sowell weren't all that peculiar in articulating that. And people forget this. And, you know, in a lot of sort of the popular discussion of black nationalism and black power. First of all, people like Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X, before he kind of takes his leftward turn, were oftentimes making very similar claims about the the position of black men in the marketplace, that this is a a sphere, you know, that, you know, build up capital, build up wealth, don't get involved in these white spaces, these white spheres. So there's a long history there. And even more interesting is that in the early 1970s, a lot of black power activists uh, who are on the left basically make very similar claims like, you know, forget it. We can't go this path of political power. It's hopeless. It's useless. We have to start experimenting with the market economy. And and of course, the Nixon administration makes a big deal out of this. They take out ads in places like Essence magazine and Ebony magazine that, you know, black power is black capitalism and so forth. So Thomas isn't like neither Thomas Sowell nor Clarence Thomas, or if you sort of situate them, they're not that peculiar. But to come to your question, which is that, you know, it seems like for the left, the obvious implication is distribute economic power then to people. And I think for Thomas, the, the, the problem with that formula, uh, well, there's a problem and there's a, a, a different response. But the, pro- the fundamental problem is, is that it can't overcome the fact of the white state, that it would be a project. In the same way that sort of uh, trying to come up with fair voting districts where black people have more representation, that is a project that is ultimately dependent upon white power. And so that you will always come back to the kind of beneficence and the paternalism of the white liberal state 
And, uh, you know, this is a pretty, you know, uh, deep sea. And, and just to give you a, a sort of a, 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 a sense of this in a framework, you know, Malcolm X used to have this distinction he used to draw between the wolf and the fox. And, you know, the wolf is, you know, bears his teeth. You know, the second you confront him, he's your enemy. He's going to tear you to shreds. He's a lethal, obvious, overt enemy. The fox can seem friendlier, um, not as dangerous, but is an ultimately j- just as much likely to seek your demise. And for, for Malcolm X, that was a distinction between white liberal racism and the kind of more obvious overt uh, white racism that you would see in the South. Clarence Thomas takes this distinction on, only he he, he makes it between copperheads and, and um, water moccasins, but it's the same point of view. And that ultimately what he would say is, is that to, 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 to think that kind of white liberals would re- that you could trust them to redistribute economic power through the state in the way that you're proposing is to expose you to a far more lethal kind of paternalism that would, you know, sort of stab you in the back just when you least expect it. And for Thomas, you know, um, He's asked about this, you know, how could you possibly be in the Reagan administration? And he says, you know what you're getting when you when you make your alliances with these people. Nobody's going to smile at you. Uh, nobody's going to be, you know, friendly to you. And then, you know, it's obvious who they are. And I, you know, for him, I think there's just a kind of a, 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 a fundamental disconnect between thinking, you know, that these sort of white liberals are your friends and you could rely upon them. Uh, versus the reality of of who they are, and you might be able to advance a broader spe- percentage and segment of uh, the African American population with some sort of redistribution, but there would be a ceiling on exactly how much you were ever able to escape the domination of white people in that way. Like you might have this general rising of votes, but it's still this uh, universal condition of domination. Whereas if you have the uh, yeah the the market as a potential zone to compete in and and succeed in, you can there is the dream of like actual escape from domination and actual control of your own life, and like a, a few people having that is is a, is a more worthy thing to pursue than a, a universal sort of uh, 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 welfare paternalism that that uh, denies the possibility of escape. Yeah. And, you know, I think the really important thing, just like Thomas really is a a racial separatist. I mean, I know in his own life and that creates all kinds of issues around his own life and Ginny Thomas and all the rest of it. I, I, you know, I don't have a good answer to her in a second. Yeah. Um, But he really believes like, you know, the bulk of black people should stay pretty far away from white people and, you know, to enmesh themselves, to immerse or to involve themselves with, you know, white liberal Democrats um, is, is, you know, a kind of a, a, a bad move. Um, and yeah, the, the benefits that are going to flow to the, to black people are going to be few. It's going to be concentrated in a couple of, you know, a small cohort of black men. But that's the other side of this romance of his is, you know, it's, it's not a kind of a vision of a democratic black community. You know, again, you say black nationalism and people all automatically think left, egalitarian, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, Thomas, you know, believes that there's a social community, but it is very hierarchical. It is very patriarchal. Um, and that's, you know, he has said very clearly the salvation of the black uh, community depends upon the fate of black men. Uh, and so, you know, you take the kind of separatism and then you take this sort of emphasis on black men. Um, and I think the view starts at least cohering whether or not it's, you know, even remotely politically plausible as a program. I mean, you, you mentioned that one of uh, Thomas has long said one of his favorite songs is uh, They Smile in Your Face, Backstabbers. Right. Right. And, you know, you can, I think that's a, a very good distillation of his point of view in a lot of this. But when it comes to like the redistribution of economic rights, do you find that like, this is similar to trying to play gotcha with him on benefiting from affirmative action, because at the end of the day, it's, you know, fruit of the poison tree. It's something given to you that ruins any uh, advancement that you may have in society. Like, for instance, like 
Matt, I think you said on the show, like, he doesn't even enjoy being a Supreme Court justice because in the back of his mind, you know, uh, some, like someone just gave it to him because he's black. Yeah, I, I think that was well put. You know, it, it, um, this is the tricky thing with Thomas is that, you know, people always try to come up with these gotchas. And usually he's like told a story that's more gotcha than gotcha. So, you know, it's very hard to, to pin that kind of thing on him. But but yeah, I mean, it's interesting you bring up about being on the Supreme Court. There's this famous interview with him from in Esquire magazine sometime in the late 90s. I can't remember when. And what what Thomas would oftentimes do was he would um, serve as kind of a mentor figure to black uh, students and high school students in the Washington, D.C. area who were poor and working class. And, you know, he would meet with them and so forth. And so the reporters is the witness to this meeting. And. Thomas is talking in his chambers with this high, this you know black high school student, and they're chatting, blah 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 blah. And then finally he says, "So what are your plans for college?" And you know it's a very warm and friendly discussion. And um, the 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 student says, "Oh, I, I got into Brown," and you know you could sort of the 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 temperature just like it drops in the whole conversation. And Thomas is, says, "You know, Thomas says to him, oh." That's, you know, that's not a good idea. You, you don't want to go to Brown. And he says, you know, you've got to understand you're going to, you know, basically you're going to go there. You're going to be surrounded by a lot of white kids and you're going to see how lonely that experience is. And he says, and then he says this thing that's just kind of incredible. He says, you know, I oftentimes feel the same way myself today, you know, and he's been on the Supreme Court for, you know, six, seven years at that point. But, he, you know, he's narrating the sense of sort of isolation he feels um, as the one black at the time, the one black person in, in a sea of white people. And this is something that he brings up in, in the, the, the kind of conferences they have on the court constantly that like he's, you know, again, it's changed now. But at the time, you know, I'm the only black person on the court. I'm the only person who went to segregated schools. I'm the only person who went through integration. Um, uh, so it, it's not, um, it doesn't seem to be like an experience he takes much pleasure in. <laughs> I'll always give him credit for, uh, the thing that liberals like to make fun of him for, which is not asking questions during oral arguments. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Part, part of that generalized, like seeing through so much of the, the ritual bullshit of this whole thing of like, we all know how we're going to vote. What, what are you got asking these people questions for? I, I we all say, know we could just do a show of hands at the beginning of this. This right. is a fucking joke. I have to say, when I was writing my book, and I would say even up until the first couple of years after it went out, came out, the single most consistent question I got um, from liberal audiences was, "Why doesn't he ask any questions?" <laughs> and they just because they can't imagine that. Like if they if I was there, oh my god. Yeah, oh, I, I would I, want to yeah. joust in the, yeah, the legal, yeah. the legal battlefield. Yes, it's it's a it's a real you know a seminar of great minds kind of a thing. <laughs> and I, what's interesting though is you don't get that question anymore, partially because he started asking questions, but partially also because people have now begun to one wrap their heads around the fact that this guy is incredibly powerful. Um, and so I've noticed a real switch. Not only do you not see though he's you know. And, and with that question about, you know, why doesn't he ask questions? It was always this assumption that he's dumb, that he's Scalia's puppet. You know, he was actually called Scalia's bitch. Um, was he a Plato oysters? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, people don't do that anymore. You know, now I, I do think part of why people are more interested in the corruption charge um, is that, I mean, in addition to being true, you know, they're they're trying to reckon with his power, which for you know, 20 some odd years that he was on the court, nobody ever, ever thought twice about. And now it's become clear that he's very powerful. And so then the question is, well, how can we make sense of that? Um, and I think part of the corruption story is is trying to come to terms with the fact of his power. Uh, you also write about like his becoming a Supreme Court justice and how in with the benefit of time, he has only grown more angry about what he does, de- what he describes as a high tech lynching during the whole Anita Hill controversy. And I think with this, like, I don't know, you mentioned again, like his ideas about black manhood. 
And look, it, like his the, the project of marrying like Milton Friedman to like black separatism is like okay, like that's for you all laid out. But his views, probably his longest landing, longest lasting legacy at this point will be the Dobbs decision and the curtailment of women's rights in this country. Where does his views on like m- women and gender and like sexuality, like how, how are those articulated? Sure. Yeah, um, you know it's interesting because you brought up Anita Hill and. You know, I say in the book, it's, you know, it's obvious to everybody who's really investigated it that Thomas committed perjury uh, and was guilty of everything that Anita Hill said. And at the same time, what's also true, I think, to anybody who knows anything about Thomas is that in a weird way, when he said that comment about the high tech lynching, that was that was a, a very truthful moment for him. It was a kind of moment that he had been preparing for for most of his adult life, not because he knew that he was going to be caught out by Anita Hill, uh, because in his story of, you know, the black community and black nationalism, you know, there's the power of black men. And then there's always been the sort of the treachery and the at, at best, the weakness of black women and at worst, the treachery of black women. Um, one of the things that Thomas becomes famous. What puts Thomas on the map in the first place is this interview he did in 1980 with Juan Williams or part of a profile. And where he says um, he had gone to the Fairmont conference, which was this big sort of launching point for black conservatives. It wasn't just black conservatives. In fact, at the Fairmont conference was this conference in San Francisco at the Fairmont Hotel. Uh, Charles Hamilton, who was the co-author with Stokely Carmichael of Black Power was there. So it was a a slightly more heterodox, but, you know, gathering. But but Juan Williams, uh, you know, interviews uh, Thomas and Thomas makes this incredibly ugly comment about his sister. And he says, you know, she's so dependent on welfare that she gets mad when the uh, the when the mailman is late with the check. And this, you know, kind of set off wildfire. Uh, and he ultimately had to apologize for it. Um, but he tells but to you his something sister. About- <laughs> or just the, the public at large? The public at large. Uh, yeah. No, I don't think he ever apologized to his sister about that. Um, I mean, you know, so you know, it shows, you know, he's a total snake in a lot of ways. But he has always had this view. And it really is a romance because the actual story of men and women in his life is like a lot more complicated. And his sister ends up being the kind of, um, you know, holds up the whole family back in pinpoint and is working three jobs, you know, to kind of keep things together, taking care of elders in the family and young people and so forth. But setting that the reality aside, you know, he's always viewed uh, black women as kind of really at the bottom of the totem pole Um, and women in general. um, He does not have, you know, a particularly um, positive view of them. And so what's interesting about, um, the Dobbs decision, and I, I would actually go back a couple of years before that. I, I can't, oh, it, I think it's, it's, I can't remember the name of the case, but it was in like 2020, 2021, or no, 19, uh, 2019, excuse me. Um, he sets out his longest opinion on abortion. And what he says very clearly in that opinion, I think it's Box versus Planned Parenthood of something or other, is that um, he he reaches back into the archive of Margaret Sanger and sort of the the, the kind of uh, fraternization between birth control advocates and eugenics um, and really develops this whole account that abortion and birth control have essentially been a kind of plot of the white community to destroy black people. And he quotes from NAACP uh, 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 statements in the 1960s about the dangers of birth control in Harlem and, and so forth, um, and how it's being used to kind of restrict the black population. So, you know, for him, abortion it has very little to do with, you know, women's rights about which he doesn't really think very highly in the first place. Uh, but, but secondarily, abortion is really once more, what it represents is the agency of white liberals who are, you know, extending their tentacles into the black community. And, you know, we can go a lot further with this, uh, but I mean, I would say that basically that's his point of view on the, on the question of women's rights and, and abortion. 
Well, you know, like uh, bring bring up the Margaret Sanger thing so quickly. I mean, it brings to mind uh, your other book, The Reactionary Mind, where like something that's always stuck with me from that is that like the, the conservative ideology or reactionary ideology, it's not really like an ideology as such. It's a series of improvisations. It's like a yes and routine to just keep mm-hmm. dealing with like an increasingly democratic society. Are, are these like is the eugenics thing? Is that another improvisation by Thomas to like uh, to to say something about it, or or is this or is this uh, coming from someplace real? Or I think that is more of an improvisation. I think that's a fair point because most of his previous abortion opinions were pretty just boilerplate Republican Party you know stuff. There was nothing interesting there that I could find that in any way distinguished anything. So I do think um, that was definitely. Uh, a kind of an improv- improvisation um, that, you know, unfortunately has had quite a bit of influence. I mean, the second he put that into the opinion, you then see lower courts, conservatives on lower courts start referencing that opinion. And there is this kind of feedback loop between, you know, Federalist Society people, lower court just uh, judges, Thomas's own um, clerks, who many of whom go on to become judges Um, And so it is a bit of a network. And I think with that one in particular, I think it's definitely, you know, pretty tactical and I don't put much stock into it. It's it's also great trolling. I mean, uh, (laughs) oh, you liberals, you love uh, you say you love black people, uh, but you also are in favor of uh, making sure there are way fewer of them than there would otherwise be. What's up with that? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, this has always been, you know. The, the the line between trolling and sort of jurisprudence with Thomas <laughs> is is a fine one, um, and you see a lot of this. I mean, you know, we haven't even gotten into the issue of gun rights. I mean, you know, his whole story on gun rights is you know lifted straight from Eric Froner and Eric um, Herbert Apthecker. For you know, and for people who don't know that, he was member of the Communist Party, was the pioneering historian of, of slave revolts. You know, Thomas's footnotes are just laden with these references going back to the 19th century and, and slavery and, and, and abolition and reconstruction um, on the centrality of arms for black people or black men. So, again, you know, a troll or, or jurisprudence, I, I, I leave that to the, the lawyers to sort of call that one. Well, whether it's the the Margaret Sanger thing or bringing up like the importance of firearms and like black liberation struggles and like what's fascinating, like the overall, as we describe it, his kind of I suppose the term now would be Afro pessimism or racial pessimism that like, you know, that white people are fundamentally racist and that America is a fundamentally racist country and that nothing is ever going to change that. The interesting thing is like that point of view is very much in vogue these days. And like sort of, you can see for obvious reasons, you look around and you're like, well, shit, like why is everything still so bad? But like that idea, it's just, it's, it's, it, there are uses for that in, the, in like a left-wing sensibility, but it's also very useful to the overall right-wing project as well, depending on how you, which way you shade it. If like, if your project is greater racial hierarchy and a separatism. Right. And you know, the way I think about this, um, there was a, a great book that came out uh, 30 years ago now, called The Rhetoric of Reaction by Albert Hirschman, who was a economist and political scientist. And he, um, he's, he said there's basically three tropes or three ways of thinking about reactionary argument. One is perversity. Uh, and that is, whatever you're trying to do, you're going to produce, in fact, the opposite result. You're going to make the very problem you're trying to solve worse. So you try to solve poverty, you make poverty worse. That's perversity. The second trope is jeopardy. Whatever you try to do, you may succeed in it, but you're going to jeopardize some other value that you hold. So let's say you 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 start off. I'm in favor of freedom and equality. You you end up pushing for equality, but you restrict freedom. So that's the uh, the jeopardy trope on in right wing reactionary thought. The third trope was what he called futility, and this is the argument that. You know, whereas the first two tropes acknowledge that you're doing something, you're achieving something, it may be perverse or it may be jeopardizing, but you're doing something. The futility argument on the right says, no matter what you do, you're never going to, you're, it's absolutely futile. You're never going to achieve anything along the lines of what you think or uh, along any lines. And um, what Hirschman says two things about that, what the futilitarian argument. 
One is, is that it is the most dangerous and insidious of right wing arguments. It's the, because it's the most deflating, deflationary argument. And second, he says, part of what makes it so insidious and dangerous is that it has a weird um, way of mimicking left wing structural arguments. Anybody who's been on the left in any kind of activist movement or whatever knows that there's always that person who stands up and says, oh, all of you guys are ridiculous, you know, if you're in the labor movement or whatever, because capitalism is this kind of deep structural force that cannot be overcome through these kind of, you know, mechanisms that you're trying to engage in. And I see... um, Thomas's, I see Thomas's Afro pessimism very much in that light of the futilitarianism, and there's a reason why um, I brought it up in the book. It's not to say that you know Thomas is like Afro pessimists on the left and all the rest of it, but to just say that that kind of argument has a history on the right, and it's not just about race; it's about a whole bunch of things um, having to do with you know political efforts at redistribution and all the rest of it. And that, you know, the kind of the most the the most poisonous thinkers on the right have have been able to inject their poison because there's a kind of superficial similarity and sometimes not so superficial similarity with certain left wing tropes. And particularly, I think, at moments of like sort of defeat and extended defeat, which is, I think, where we've been. Um, for quite some time in this country. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very hard, attractive argument because it seems correct. A, yeah, it makes sense of your defeat. And it almost gives it a kind of theological gloss. So, you know, Matt Carp wrote this very great article in Harper's, you know, about a year ago about the 1619 Project. And he said, you know, the thing that recurs, the metaphors are, this is part of the nation's DNA or it's part of its original sin, racism. And, you know, that's partially, you know, you could say that's just rhetorical and all the rest of it. But it does, like I said, it does apply a kind of, you know, deep sense of fatalism um, that makes the idea, you know, the idea of political po- you know, politics seem kind of, uh, you know, silly. And, you know, I think there's a certain kind of activist who will say, well, you know, we're going to lose, but we should still go down fighting kind of a thing. Yeah, you know, and that's fine for the activists, but you know, you're not going to get you don't get people to kind of make great sacrifices of the sort that the left is always dependent upon for the sake of, you know, sort of suicide and 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 defeat and failure. Like failure is not an attractive political slogan. <laughs> um and so I do I do think there's, you know, there's stuff in Thomas and I and I should say Thomas came to that fatalism and sense of pessimism and defeat before he shifted to the right, you know. And so what role that played in his shift to the right is a, a, an open question. Well, it, because it's just it's very it's very seductive because it offers you really a out on any moral responsibility for anything like if, if, if you could definitely see in Thomas's uh, trajectory, like coming to a moment of like, oh, this is. This is never going to change. Yeah. So this here is a path for success, uh, uh, renown, all the stuff that I can take. And yes, it's you know it means being a right winger, but it's also it, it it means abandoning like the hope for this stuff. But that stuff was never going to happen. And what I can right. claim instead to like feel that there's some nobility here is uh, like the sense that I am honest in a way that right. others aren't. Like yeah. yes. And, and that like my, me taking a bunch of money from this uh, psycho hillbilly and smoking cigarettes on his uh, cigars on his yacht, that is more virtuous because it is more honest yeah. than somebody going in front of the NAACP and say, vote for Democrats a few more times and we're going to get some uh, justice in this country. Yeah. I mean, what one of the early things that sort of made me interested in Thomas was exactly what you're picking up on. And I called it kind of racial candor, um, that there's a kind of appeal to him. And, you know, uh, being honest and clear eyed, which, again, I think anybody who's been on the left knows very well the type of person uh, who, you know, really prides themselves on being candid and clear eyed and, you know, without any illusion whatsoever about the nature of things. Um, And, you know, there is a kind of, uh, you know, path to 
I, I don't like to use the word cynicism because, you know, I'm a pretty cynical person myself and there's nothing really wrong with it. But there's a kind of corrosive cynicism, I guess I would say, at the heart of that, um, that I think has far more like widespread cultural appeal uh, than people realize. I mean, one of the things that was really interesting in, in talking about the book with different audiences, I would have a lot of people come up to me afterwards who were black and they would say, you know, you're talking about my father, you're talking about my grandfather. It's always men they're talking about. But, you know, that this is a very widespread view. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily result in people voting Republican by any stretch. Um, but that sense that, you know, like, don't talk to me about, you know, uh, mass protest and don't talk to me about that kind of, I don't want to hear it. Like, that's just a path to defeat um, is, 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 I think, much more widespread than people want to acknowledge. And I, I just want to add one other thing to that, because, Matt, you brought up about, you know, it sort of lets him morally off the hook, which I think is true. I think the flip side, though, is that it also creates a kind of very weirdly moralistic politics on the left um, that says, you know, do this not because you're going to win, because we know we're not going to win, but do it because it's right. And again, I think that's a, a oftentimes a, a very weak position. I, I just finished teaching this term, and the, the last book we read was W. B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. And he makes a big deal of pointing out that the, you know, the real leaders of black emancipation, the Republican Party, Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens, they had such contempt for that kind of empty moralism. And, and Sumner says, you know, never depend. If, if you're depending upon the sense of justice in people for your program, you've already lost. You know, I much more have faith in people's sense of necessity and interest and, you know, the sort of reality principle uh, in a broader, you know, in a broader sense than I would in that sort of pure moralism. So it, there's a weird uh, convergence between, you know, as you say, sort of him getting out of moral responsibility on his side, uh, but then the left sort of converging on this very uh, moralistic, absent any sense of real politique also. I guess that gets us to the uh, the current moment with Thomas, in which his uh, relationship and uh, with Harlan Crow, the the billionaire, and the many vacations they've taken together, has has put him really back in the spotlight. And uh, I was wondering, Corey, when when this story broke, uh, people were sharing a video that Thomas, or it was a, it was a sort of a hagiographic video promoting Thomas Clarence Thomas, yeah. in which he was talking about how like he only likes to travel in America. And he only likes to travel by RV, obviously in contrast with, you know, like a jaunts to a, you know, Icelandic volcano or whatever. I prefer the RV parks. I prefer the Walmart parking lots to the beaches and things like that. But there's something normal to me about it. I come from regular stock. But in oh, it, he yeah. says, yeah. I'm from normal stock. And I'm just wondering if you saw that and just that phrase, I'm from normal stock. That just stuck with me so, so much about Thomas saying, I'm normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, can, what can one say? I mean, uh, you know, that story about traveling in the RVs. And I can't remember in that video if he says this or not, but in his, I think it's in his book or in his memoir. He talks about the RV and they would park in, in, in parking lots for Walmart. Um, and that, that was where he and Ginny would stay as they traveled across America from, you know, island to island of Walmarts. And that's how they saw the real America. And the one, you know, it, almost it sort of feels a little silly. It's like it's such an old trope in American politics of, you know, the common man who, you know, Reagan totally did this all the time. Um, and, you know, George W. Bush also did this, you know, like, uh, you know, wearing, you know, it was the sort of whole affectation of wearing jeans, um, you know, Reagan clearing was brush. sort of, a, you know, clearing brush, you know, uh, was a rancher. Um, and of course, you know, everything with Reagan was paid by his corporate benefactors. And I mean, his whole lifestyle, we now know, down to his, you know, ranch was bought by his corporate benefactors. So, it's a kind of old story on the right. And I don't, 
there's a way in which we can sort of make too much of a fetish of Clarence Thomas. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I have no problem with people pointing out the hypocrisy of it all because it's totally true. I guess I would just say it's a pretty standard right wing um, story. But but as it comes to as it relates to Harlan Crow, and I think like I, I read you on this, trying to call this out as like hypocrisy or corruption, mm. at least as it regards to Thomas, only goes so far because as I, I think I hope we've explicated so far, this kind of corruption is not corruption as such to him. This is the benefits of being a democratically engaged citizen in America. Right. And yeah, like, so, you, know, you said, like, you know, through economic freedom, black people can have these little niches of, of right. freedom and autonomy. Well, he has quite a significant niche of freedom and autonomy yeah, right. for himself. But like yeah. his friendship with Harlan Crow and like all the benefits that he's accrued as a result of that in terms of vacations or Hitler right. memorabilia or whatever, whatever he's getting. <laughs> um, like, no, like th th this is th this is this is a totally ethical invocation of your rights yeah. as a democratic citizen. Yeah. And this, you know, this goes way back. And, you know, just um, in, in 1987, Thomas gives this speech at the Pacific Research Institute, which is a libertarian think tank outfit out in San Francisco. And he sort of lays out this vision, he, you know, of the problem with the New Deal liberal. And I, you know, I, and when I say that, I just, you know, want people because people hear liberal and they think Bill Clinton and people, you know, Hillary Clinton and so forth. But you know, uh, Clarence Thomas is really talking about people like John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist, the great, you know, liberal left economist, FDR and so forth. And he says, the problem with those guys, the New Deal liberal, is they really have contempt, like deep seated contempt for men who make money. They think it's crass. They think it's vulgar. They think it's materialistic and so on and so forth. And he says, you know, the, the, pe the people who they really value, those liberals, are the the what he called the idealistic professions. And by that he meant journalists, lawyers, and professors. And these are all people who engage in like speech is their fundamental um, activity. And that's how they make, you know, they make their living is by speech. And he lays out there and he, he does two things. So what's interesting is the first, it's it's really a sense of culture war, which we've really forgotten when we use that term culture war, but the original culture war uh, for the right was about this whole question of money and like, do you value men who make money, the businessman, or do you value professors and journalists and the eggheads, the, the pencil nets? Yeah, the, exactly. The eggheads, right? Going back, At the to people the who go out and make and create and you know change exactly. the world. Exactly, and that was really you know it was obviously a whole economic battle and a political battle, but it was also a cultural battle. You know, like. And that was the project of the right was to rehabilitate those men of money to show that these were virtuous men who, you know, made America and made it great and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you do mention that Clarence Thomas opens every uh, term of the Supreme Court or every like, with a uh, screening yes. of the fountainhead that all his clerks are yes. required to attend. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, there there you've you've got that sort of moral rehabilitation of the of the man of money. Um, but but, you know. Taking that from the sphere of political ideology to constitutionalism, what he sets out in this speech is something that has since become really important for the right wing court. And that is, we have to figure out a way to make money making have as, as sacred a status in the constitutional pantheon as does speech, free speech in the First Amendment. And so what he, what he sets out there and what other conservatives have done with him is to say, that money making um, and the world of money is a, an expressive world of speech. And now we get into the sphere of campaign finance so that when you make a contribution or first of all, when a campaign spends money. So when Bernie Sanders you know, spends money uh, to have a rally or to get its message out, that's a form of speech. And if you were to, 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 to prohibit Sanders, the campaign, from spending money, you would be prohibiting um, his speech from getting out. And then Thomas takes it a second step and says, the contributors to those campaigns, you know, so um, I'm sure, you know, you guys may have contributed money to the Sanders campaign. When you were doing that, you were exercising your speech rights. Um, and so that he extends that argument to say that, OK, so um, when a citizen, a private citizen donates money to a campaign, 
um, he is or she is expressing their belief and their desire to get this message out. And so you say, well, hold on a second. We have an extremely unequal country. There are a lot of wealthy people. Um, if they're contributing to a campaign more money than you know you or I are contributing, um, they're going to have more access. Um, they're going to have more influence. And the thing about Thomas is he says, yeah, that's right. They will. And that is what you call influence peddling, what you call corruption, is basically is democracy in action. Um, this is... Uh, people, citizens exercising their influence. And so now we, you know, leap forward 30 years uh, to this whole Harlan Crow thing. And, you know, again, what's so kind of fascinating is, is that all you had to, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say I knew about the Harlan Crow. Other issues of, of gifts and so forth have been reported in the past. It's, this does go way back. The LA Times was on this story during the aughts. It's been well known. Uh, but I certainly didn't know the extent of the gifts or anything like that. But what's interesting is you go back to those um, his his opinions and his speeches, and he's kind of, kind of laid the whole thing out for you right there and then. Um, that this is his conception of what a democracy is all about: is rich men amassing wealth uh, and influencing the political sphere. And once again, you have that you have that distinction with liberalism, which claims. Uh, you no, know, we have a society geared around money and geared around accumulation and allows for this vast accumulation, but that doesn't mean you have more rights to X, Y, or Z. No. That that's an incoherence that, that right. the right is able to cut through. And like that's another one of those uh yeah. those astringent like reality things that right. they get to stand on. It's like we have it, we are at least acknowledging what the actual reality of a capitalist society is yes rights accrue at the top like the money does these are right. all synonyms for one another and if i could push that one step further you know this whole idea about money is speech which a lot of people who are liberals and on the left sort of heard for the first time with citizens united and so for many people that whole idea is something that john roberts came up with and and concocted the irony of that position is, if you go back to the original campaign finance decision from 1975, which is Buckley v. Vallejo, that was a, it was a, a majority, a, a practically unanimous decision. The whole premise that money is speech is accepted as, as the foundation of that decision, which most people think was, well, there's some argument about who authored it, but it was certainly signed on to by um, William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall, who were the sort of liberal titans of the court. And so the, the principle that money is speech on the one hand was accepted in that decision, but, and this is the kicker, what was very much rejected by the court was that you could therefore limit the, the role of money in politics for the sake of equalizing speech. In other words, you accept the premise that money is speech, but you cannot, in the name of the First Amendment, try to equalize the speech um, by basically saying everybody has to spend the same amount. And that doesn't even touch on the larger point you're getting at, which is about the inequality of the society as a whole. So there's a, there's a whole complicated role that liberals have played in this, in this, um, in this firmament that just simply did not begin with John Roberts and the Citizens United case. What do you make of the idea that like, the, the, the corruption between Harlan Crow and Clarence Thomas, like a lot of people on the right dismissed it as this kind of like, oh, do you really think he's changing his vote or some kind of like straight up quid pro quo? But what do you make of the idea that uh, I believe I read from you that Clarence Thomas has said in <laughs> public statements, you know, I could be making a lot more money in the private sector. So uh, think of me, think of that the next time you're planning a vacation to New Zealand, mm -hmm. because I could potentially retire while Biden is president. I mean, I, I actually didn't I didn't know that he had said that. Um, but I mean, I, I have to say on this one, like, I, I think if you know, if you're trying to look for a smoking gun, which people did have tried to look on some of his decisions like that, it was, you know, a clear quid pro quo. I mean, A, I think you're not going to find it. And B, the irony of looking for a quid pro quo like that is that Thomas and the conservatives will actually be be the ones who say that unless you can find a quid pro quo that's essentially the equivalent of a bribe, 
um, there is no corruption. And so I, I, I think it's, it's a, a, it's a kind of wrongheaded way to go about it. I mean, I think the bigger corruption, if you will, is, you know, it's just the general shift on the court to the right, which, you know, big money certainly had a huge role to play in. I mean, they've created, uh, you know, not just in the obvious ways, but they created this whole intellectual infrastructure. Thomas has been the beneficiary of this. He's been a part of this um, for a long time. I, I just, I, I guess my general point of view is that there's a kind of like a sincerity hunt that's on, which is that if you can prove the providence of an opinion is pure thought somehow or another, you've exonerated that opinion from all of its problems. Um, and, you know, to me, Thomas is an ideologue. Um, he doesn't need to be paid for his opinions. I mean, I'm sure he just used this as kind of an extra, but that doesn't in any way save those opinions from, from what's wrong with them. <laughs> and I, you know, I just, I, I think, uh, you know, the left just has this problem of looking for smoking guns. It just reminds me now that you brought it up of like during the Trump, you know, administration, like, oh, we're going to prove that he, you know, Russia was this and, you know, yeah. We've got some special prosecutor who's going to really save us. And, you know, we're on Russia watch every night. And, you know, it's just it's not the way these people are going to be defeated. Um, and, and, and likewise, Thomas, like Thomas's problems and everything that's wrong with him begins so long before um, you see this big money pouring into him. And, and I should say the big money pours into him. Because he's, you know, he's already paved the way for it. Like the causality runs the other direction. Well, that's because liberal, I mean, liberals are, are, you know, always going to uh, end up grasping for procedural gotchas and, and uh, violations of uh, struct laws and, and norms because they can't have an ideological conflict because at fundamental levels, they agree with the premises of uh, conservatism when it comes to the economic distribution. And, they have no interest in seeing those interrogated. And so they really can't go any deeper than procedural violations to try to, to uh, uh, neutralize their opponents. And not to mention, you know, I think up and I, I think this is actually beginning to change and I'm glad to see it. But up until very recently, virtually every liberal was committed to the whole sanctity of the Supreme court and the halo around the Supreme court. And so, you know, Thomas, in this sense, has always been this weird thorn in their, you know, uh, in in their minds, you know, because of the way he got on the court, because of Anita Hill, because he didn't, you know, come up the, the path that most justices have in recent years come up. And so it's 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 not just I think you're right about the proceduralism, but I also think there's been this kind of that court fetishism um, that has really been. Uh, a millstone around the way liberals have thought about this stuff. I think that at least has begun to change a bit. I know we've just been counseled not to look for smoking guns, so I'll merely direct your attention to one that is perhaps loaded, which to me, <laughs> talking about corruption and Clarence Thomas, I mean, to me, like the most obvious one would be his relationship to his wife, Ginny Thomas, yeah. who is... A bit, she's a bit, she's a bit of a she's a bit of a screwball. She's got she's a little, she does things a little bit different. But you know, like her advocacy for political groups that had business in front of the court that he never disclosed. But I guess I'm just more interested in Ginny Thomas and Clarence, like their relationship. What what, what, do you, what do you what do we know of their marriage? Or like, what did you come across about their relationship in your writing of this book? I mean, I got to be honest. I sort of stayed away from it. Um, you know, I, I I tried to kind of do a little bit of research on it, and I didn't. I didn't find much that was all that interesting beyond pointing out the obvious that, you know, this is somebody who up until the day he met Ginny Thomas thought that interracial relationships and interracial, you know, dating was wrong. And then he meets her and, you know, he obviously changes point of view on that. And so, so I didn't, you know, really look into it too much. I, uh, I think there's actually a, a person who's writing about it uh, for New York magazine um, who's, I, I hope we'll come up with something um, that was will be a little a little bit more illuminating than the facts of what we already know um, about Ginny Thomas. You know, I, I yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't think I really have much to add to it. I do. I I kind of think that he just when she starts talking about you know the two thousand two hundred mules and and the, the Soros, <laughs> I think he's just like. 
he's like loving it. It's just like look at this, look at this crazy fucking this is like he's got a pet <laughs> rattlesnake. Yeah, yeah. In, in a in the thing, and he's just like tapping the glass, like, look, at, yeah. this is what they're like. Look at this fucking little person. Let's let's get at the RV. Tell me, tell me more about the uh, the Illuminati. <laughs> this is this is my wife's argument as well, and I, I, it, it could very well be true. I mean, I I just um, I I don't have it. I just have no special insight into to the question at all. Well, I guess okay. So to, to, to round things out here, uh, we're, we're, okay, in twenty twenty three. Clarence Thomas is the oldest Supreme Court justice. Was that correct? Yeah. No, he's, he's definitely like, the oldest. He's the longest serving. He's the oldest. So, you know, look, there's always, there's always a possibility he could just die, which is, you know, not, not outside the realm of possibilities. But the justices that have came after him, particularly the three that were appointed under Trump. And if you want to talk about corruption, how about just the fact that a guy who didn't win the popular vote got to yeah. appoint three Supreme Court justices <laughs> that are going to be alive for a generation at least? Like, so I mean, there's a question of like, what, what do we do about this? Because like whether Thomas is on the court or not, like it's pretty much set. And that condition is, in my opinion, intolerable for a, any human being currently alive in this country. You mentioned that the, the beginning of a crack up of the sanctity of the courts as an institution among liberals. But I, I don't know. I mean, just your thoughts on like, because, you know, it's a question that people bang their head up against all the time. What are we going to do about the Supreme Court? Are we going to yeah. impeach a justice, stack the court, get rid of judicial review? I mean, wh where is this all going? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I would add, in addition to the three, um, you know, George W. Bush, of course, even though he appointed both of his justices when he'd been reelected the first time around, he, of course, didn't win the popular vote also. Um, and that's how he got into office. And I mean, I think it's it's a really important point, you know, to stress, I, you know, ideal. I, you know, I'm not a political operative or strategist, but, you know, the Supreme Court has always been, um, you know, it's always had this very uh, weird status in American politics um, because it has so much power. Um, mm -hmm. And yet it's been this counter majoritarian institution. And, you know, people spent 50 years trying to make sense of that contradiction. Um, how in a democracy can you have an institution that has so much power? But now we have this situation, as you pointed out, where it's, you know, at least in the past, you could say these, you know, these justices were appointed by presidents who had been um, elected with the popular vote. And, the you know, the kind of malapportionment in the Senate wasn't nearly to the degree that it is today among small states versus big states. Where it's all going, though, I don't know. I mean, I do think I mean, to me, the most the, the most promising, frankly, is the idea of, you know, the court stripping, I mean, sorry, Congress stripping the court of certain kinds of jurisdiction. Um, I, you know, I think it's a totally democratic argument. Um, and I think it's one that the left, you know, really should take on. Uh, I think liberals should take it on. Um, but, you know, you're <laughs> I don't think anybody really has the answer to it. Um, to how to go about doing this. But, you know, I, I will say, I mean, a couple of things, you know, the United States is, is, has faced a, a stacked Supreme Court before. And what's interesting is that, you know, FDR in 1935, and I, I don't like to kind of get into the romance of the New Deal because there is a lot of romance around this, but, you know, the Supreme Court struck down, you know, item after item after item of the New Deal culminating in 1935 in, in the Schechter decision. And, you know, FDR, you know, God bless, you know, holds a press conference and he just starts walking people through, you know, in this very kind of um, engaging, popular way, like everything that's wrong with how the Supreme Court thinks about this. And there used to be a tradition in this country that like, you know, for all the Constitution's problems, that this is like a, a document for people. It's not a document for people who went to fucking, you know, Harvard Law School or Yale Law School. This is a document that ordinary people get to interpret. And, you know, all, all the things that we attribute, you know, the 13th Amendment, the 14th, like those were things that came out of the political sphere. They didn't come from Supreme Court justices. And so, you know, that doesn't really answer your question, you know, what are we going to do about it? But I think to the extent that, we can sort of get back to some of these, you know, ideas of popular constitutionalism um, and, and rest the document and the, you know, out of the hands of the Supreme Court, 
um, is all the better. Um, and, you know, I think there are people on the left um, who are trying to develop arguments in that regard, whether they achieve any traction politically or not. I don't, you know, who the hell knows. Um, but I, I don't I don't see any other way around it, you know, except to kind of go through it like that. But at least to begin to like begin to remove from the popular consciousness, the idea of the law and the constitution as this kind of like yeah. sacred document that's like above reproach or political, uh, just politics in general. Yeah. You know, and, and, and to that, to, to that issue, um, I was part of this NPR, um, uh, documentary on Thomas and when it was very interesting, it opens up, the season opens up with the host going to Constitution Day at a Denver public school, high school. And what's, you know, I don't know what it was. I mean, I'm sure if if you had things like that in your high school, you know, everybody there back in, you know, when I was in high school would be talking about the Supreme Court and, da, 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 and the, sake, the sanctity of the Constitution. And all these high school students were like, what are you talking about? The Constitution is this completely crap document interpreted by this institution that's totally corrupt. And, and, and these are people who are like the debate champions and, you know, sort of Constitution Day type champions. They weren't the, the cigarette I, smoking kids, these, <laughs> no. these are the high achievers. Yeah. yeah, these are these are the grinds, you know, and I thought the truth of the matter is, is that that was once again, the sort of, the, you know, if you were an up and comer in the 1910s, the 1920s and 1930s, even if you went to places like Harvard Law School, that would be the kind of educate you would be taught that the law is a political weapon and the only question is who wields it and how and you know that's where people like you know justice frankfurt or felix frankfurt came out of that tradition and so to me it's not inconceivable you know that that was the united states that wasn't you know some kind of outre you know european formation so you know i i i don't see why it would be impossible um, you know, ha to have something like that again. All right. Well, uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave it there for today. Uh, Professor Corey Robin, the author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. 